Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm Emily, I'm the BCHA's Executive Director, um, and I'm just gonna do a few words of introduction before we hand things off to our research team who is hosting our event tonight. Um, so before we begin, I want to acknowledge uh, that Adriana, Teal, and I all live and work on the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanic peoples, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. And none of us were invited to be on this shared territory, uh, although we are grateful to be here. Um, given the turnout tonight, everyone is muted for this portion at least. Uh, we will have a section for questions at the end of the event, so if you have any, um, you can raise your hand when I ask for questions, or you could just pop in the chat anytime and our presenters might get to them uh, in their talk at the beginning. Um, but yeah, and everyone, please be respectful of each other in your questions, as always. Um, we're recording this talk tonight, so you can find it afterwards on YouTube and on our podcast. Um, and our future events line up uh, at the end of the month, we have a collaboration with another humanist group in Canada, Non-Religion in a Complex Future, which is happening on March 18th. Um, and more information about that event will be available on Monday. So watch our newsletter and social media for that release. Um, and of course, the work that we do with the report that this event is based on, and of course, this event itself could not be possible without your donations and your membership and funding. So please, uh, I'll be dropping a link to that in the chat. Um, please consider donating if you like what you see here and want to keep helping us keep it up. Um, and of course, if you haven't read the report that our speakers are going to be speaking on and poured their heart and souls into, I will also be dropping a link to that in the chat. So please check it out. Um, and with that, I'll pass things off to Adriana, uh, who I think is going to start us off tonight. Um, hi, I'm Adriana. Um, okay, so um, governments grant have the ability to grant tax exemptions. Um, they use this as a public policy tool and um, it's usually used in order to support organizations that provide services that benefit the public in some way. And the idea is that by granting organizations exemptions, it means that on taxes, it means that they have the ability to allocate more resources uh, to public services, such as um, clubs, sports teams, uh, childcare services, etc. cetera. Um, however, um, groups that receive um, these tax exemptions in general should not be groups that discriminate um, in contravention to the Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms or the BC Human Rights Codes. Um, additionally, um, groups that receive these um, exemptions also shouldn't be groups that are breaking the law as well. Um, so within our research, we attempted to look at two kinds of tax exemptions. Um, the first being permissive or statutory exemptions. And I think I can share my screen now. So we're just gonna pull up a fun diagram, which was in the report. Um, yeah, so the first kind is statutory exemptions. Um, these exemptions are granted automatically uh, by the provincial government. Um, and this includes uh, places of worship. Um, and you'll see within our diagram, um, the yellow um, building is a place of public worship, a place where um, religious activities actually take place. Um, these are granted automatically by the provincial government. The second kind are permissive tax exemptions. So these are granted by municipalities. Um, so municipal governments have the ability to apply an exemption um, based on um, existing criteria outlined in legislation. Um, so if you'll look on the diagram, um, the kind of gray field area is, for example, a parking lot or a, a field, um, or um, the darker green building, which is a, an adjoining hall, so not a place where worship directly takes place. Um, these are able to be taxed or given permissive tax exemptions by the municipality. Um, in most cases, um, munis our organizations apply for these exemptions based on um, different criteria and uh, municipal governments are given the discretion to decide the application process, um, the benefits tests, caps on how much of an exemption um, groups are getting, time limits, etc. cetera. Um, yes. Um, However, um, we noted that there were some discrepancies um, between places of public worship getting exemptions in both STEs and PTEs and other groups. Um, first off, it's the idea that um, 
places of public worship are automatically granted um, public or permissive tax exemptions or statutory exemptions. Um, it's assumed that a place of public worship automatically provides a public good, which um, is not necessarily true. Um, additionally, another issue um, we come across is that certain places um, may be discriminatory. And a common example is um, groups, uh, religious groups refusing to um, rent out um, halls or adjacent spaces um, to groups such as uh, those looking to host a LGBTQ plus wedding. Um, so in order to look at this further, we decided to conduct a survey. Um, so we began with calculating the statutory tax exemptions, the SDEs, um, and we calculated this using data available from BC assessments. And from there, we were able to find the amount of revenue that would have been foregone that was foregone um, had these places of worship been um, expected to pay the full amounts. Um, additionally, we calculated the number of permissive tax exemptions and we did this by individually going into um, each municipality's website and pulling out their, uh, the numbers out of their annual reports. So at the end of each year, um, municipalities create a report and it's kind of a summary of um, their financial status what activities they've undertaken, et cetera. And these typically contain um, the amount of exemptions that are granted to each group. Um, so in total, we were able to find um, that $45.9 million um, were exempted for statutory exemptions going to places of public worship. Um, we also found that uh, for permissive tax exemptions, $12.5 million um, dollars were exempted. Um, now, there was some variety between um, the different places and the amount of exemptions that were received. For example, um, City of Delta was granted, granted 1.3 million in permissive tax exemptions, whereas other places uh, chose to grant zero. Um, we didn't look at the reasoning why behind that in this report. However, um, in future studies, we're hoping to look at uh, different public benefits tests and to see how uh, this kind of aligns with the amount of exemptions that are being granted. Um, so in total, we found that $58.4 million in exemptions were going to places of public worship when we totaled both the STEs and the PTE calculation. And I will pass this off to Teal. Awesome, thanks Adriana. Yeah, and and so just to pick up on some of the discussion around these and this builds on what Adriana was already mentioning, um, but generally speaking, these kinds of tax exemptions are designed to go to organizations that provide a public benefit. So if you look at the list of, of the types of categories of organizations that can receive these, there are things like hospitals and schools and service organizations and historic sites and farms. And one of the challenges that you get is that there's a sort of assumption that places of worship will, oh, Adrian, I was going to say, maybe stop sharing your screen, then I can, uh, we can, uh, yeah. Um, but places of worship necessarily provide a public benefit without any kind of oversight or evaluation as to whether that is actually the case. And so there are a couple situations where this might not be the case. And so I wanted to highlight some of the issues that surround exemptions. And it's a combination of permissive and statutory exemptions. So I'll kind of blend them as we go through the conversation, because the two kind of interrelate. Um, but the first aspect is that of private clubs. So the thing about permissive and statutory tax exemptions is their support organizations that provide a public benefit. But what we find is some recipients operate as private clubs. So for example, a place of worship may only cater to co-religionists or to parishioners. And in that way, they're operating as a private club. They're not, a, they're not open to the public. Some places will have contingent services. And by that, I mean, you have to participate in their religious services or in an aspect of religious services in order to receive a service. Um, and so for example, um, a good one there is uh, St. Anne's Anglican Church in Parksville um, had a pray and stay program where people who were experiencing homelessness could crash out in the, hot, in the, uh, in the place of worship overnight. But in order to do that, um, they had to participate in a nightly prayer vigil. Uh, now the place of worship insisted this was minimal, but at the same time, that seems problematic in that the state is subsidizing an activity where people are being forced to participate in religious activity to receive a service like shelter at night. Um, that church, by the way, received $7,932 of permissive tax exemptions in 2019. So we are talking about significant amounts of money and 
the serv those services are not available to people who would not want to participate in that prayer service. Um, so either it's a form of coercion or you're excluding people in that case. Another aspect of private clubs are insular groups. So some religious communities are insular by their very nature. They close themselves off from the world. A really good example of this is the Exclusive Brethren, which it's kind of implied in the name, is an evangelical Christian organization, otherwise called the Plymouth Brethren, and they follow the doctrine of separation. The doctrine of separation basically is where a group isolates themselves from the world because it's seen as worldly, um, or as they described on their own site, um, the world or society is a system of sin and lawlessness under the domination of Satan. Um, so welcome to that, that world, I suppose. Um, but the, the, the thing there is that this organization necessarily separates themselves from society. So you have tax exemptions that are going to supporting organizations that provide a public benefit, going to an organization that is not interested in benefiting the public by the nature of their, their religious practices. They're of course entitled to have a closed off group like that, but to receive public subsidies seems problematic. Um, and that's kind of um, an aspect that we see again and again. But these groups, uh, exclusive brethren organizations, receive tons of permissive tax exemptions and statutory tax exemptions. Um, so, for example, the, the Parkview Gospel Hall in Abbotsford got $4,400 in 2019. Uh, the West Richmond Gospel Hall received $8,869 um, in, in permissive tax exemptions from Richmond um, in 2019. So this is a bit of a problem because you're literally funneling tax funding to a private organization. And as Adriana mentioned, um, we want to have a benefits test. What the BCHA is proposing is a benefits test to ensure that recipients are actively benefiting the community. But on top of that, it's really important that you have a benefits test and that the benefits test is followed. <laughs> um, because for example, Parksville, that same place with the uh, that has a church with a pray and stay policy, has a permissive tax exemption policy that says that services and activities should be equally available to all residents. So in this case, they have a benefits test, but they're not applying it. So it's as important, uh, probably more important to apply a benefits test as is to have one. And you know, what's other another interesting side point here is with respect to places of worship operating as private clubs, is the issue of the percentage of people who attend these organizations. You know, municipalities should have the ability to decide how best to benefit their community. But what we see is a decline in regular participation in religious services in Canada, such that um, in 2020, about 11% of people attended a place of worship on a weekly basis. That's down from uh, 19 or that's down from 30% in 1996 um, and 67% in 1946. So we have declining participation and if you're a municipality, you want to sit back and say, how can we maximize the benefit to our community through our tax exemption programs? And if you have a perhaps a, a place of worship that only has 12 members and they're receiving thousands of dollars in tax exemptions, perhaps that money is more effectively spent maximizing benefit in another way. So the second one, and Adrian has already hinted at this as well, um, is the aspect of some recipients of permissive tax exemptions and statutory tax exemptions exclude and discriminate. Now, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms says that you cannot discriminate against people based on their race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, mental or physical ability. And that applies to the government. So private individuals can set up their own bigoted clubs if they want to. But ultimately, the government can't has to follow the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. They can't discriminate on those bases. So if you have an organization that's operating as a private club that's excluding people on these grounds, they shouldn't be receiving money from the government because the government can't discriminate. Otherwise, what you're basically doing is you're creating discrimination with more steps involved, and it's still discrimination. And unfortunately, it's not hard to think of an example of places of worship that might exclude people, particularly as the example Adriana mentioned, um, LGBTQ plus IA people. Um, the example that we use in the report is the, um, the Smith and Chimishim um, versus the Knights of Columbus. So this is a 2005 case from the BC Human Rights Tribunal. Basically, you had a lesbian couple that wanted to book the Knights Hall for their wedding. Uh, they didn't know the Knights of Columbus were a, a Catholic men's organization. The Knights of Columbus didn't know that two women wanted to have a, a wedding there. And when the Knights of Columbus found out, they canceled the, the booking and uh, refunded the deposit. This case sort of made its way to the Human Rights Tribunal. And basically, um, the result was kind of a mixed result. The Knights of Columbus didn't say they didn't discriminate. They argued that they did discriminate, but they had a bona fide, bona fide reason for doing so. Um, Section 8.1 of the Human Rights Code of British Columbia allows you to discriminate if you have a, a bona fide reason to do so. Uh, presumably that's things like 
a bus driver can't be non-sighted um, because that would be probably quite dangerous or, you know, things like, um, you know, uh, gender and sex requirements for children's sports activities, you know, under five girls soccer and that kind of thing. Um, but the Knights of Columbus argued that they did discriminate and they were totally within their rights to do so. Um, and then the two women involved were paid some compensation because obviously there was um, costs and hardship involved in them having to change their wedding invitations and sort of, you know, individual hardship. But what's interesting here is we have an organization that's overtly admitting to discriminating. And that same organization received thousands of dollars from the city of Coquitlam um, in the form of permissive tax exemptions. So we were having trouble identifying the exact place of worship because since 2011, the, the city of Coquitlam, where this uh, place, where the Knights Hall is found, doesn't list out its permissive tax exemption recipients for places of worship. But in 2004 and 2005, the years um, surrounding this particular case, um, the city of Coquitlam gave um, $72,000 to the Archdiocese of Vancouver for five properties. And in 2005, they gave $75,000 um, to the Archdiocese of Vancouver. So here's an organization that in the BC Human Rights Tribunal has admitted to actively discriminating against LGBTQ plus people, um, receiving a lot of money in subsidy in the form of permissive tax exemptions from the city of Coquitlam. And we actually have a precedent for this, by the way. Um, some of you will recall a few years ago, um, 2018, the Liberal government amended the rules around Canada's summer jobs program. Um, and basically what this was, was they placed a rule that said that applicants must declare that the organization does not actively work to infringe upon the human rights, uh, in, to infringe upon human rights, including access to abortion. So there was some back and forth on this, but the government basically determined that their Canada Summer Jobs program, where you hire people to work for organizations like our own, and we've, full disclosure, have received amazing summer students, uh, summer researchers rather, including Adriana and our, our research team, um, through this funding. But a recipient organization can't actively be working against to undermine basic human rights. I mean, in 2019, 26 applicants were denied um, ap applications for the Canada Summer Jobs program on this basis. And so if we extend the logic of that case to permissive tax exemptions, the idea is that the state can't discriminate. I mean, it can discriminate by adding a few steps between itself and the discrimination. And as a result, anyone who receives a permissive tax exemption or a statutory tax exemption, in my opinion, and in the opinion presented in the report, should follow the charter. They're welcome to not follow the charter, but they can't receive government subsidy um, if that's the case. There's another aspect too, which is worth mentioning, and this is kind of returning to this theme that we bring up in the report, which is that we have to have benefits tests. And one of the really important things is that we wouldn't have been aware of the discriminatory rental policies of the Knights of Columbus had no one applied there. So the two women involved, women involved weren't aware that Knights of Columbus were a Catholic organization. Had they been aware, they've said this themselves in media interviews, they wouldn't have applied there because they know that this is a dis potentially discriminatory organization. And so without a benefits test, there's a lot of tacit discrimination that occurs that we would be otherwise unaware of. So we have to ask tax exemption recipients, hey, do you rent your hall to everybody or do you have restrictions on who you rent your hall to? And if they have restrictions and those restrictions violate the charter, they should not be receiving funding because then we are as a state violating the charter and we are funding discriminatory behaviors. And that's, I think, one of the aspects of having really robust um, benefits tests. So a few other elements, and this one actually is particularly relevant today given COVID, and that is some recipients could be undermining public health or overtly breaking the law. So again, this comes down to COVID aspects, but many sources have identified religious gatherings as having a high potential to serve as super spreader events. Uh, we have a page long footnote in our report highlighting examples from across the world where places of worship have been directly linked to massive spreads in COVID. Um, the one example I would highlight here is the um, Shincheonji, and I apologize for my pronunciation, um, Church of Jesus in Seoul, Korea, South Korea, um, which at one point was responsible for 36% of COVID cases in South Korea from having one mega church gathering. So the reason why places of, uh, of worship are particularly uh, risky super spreader locations um, is that they're in closed spaces typically. You have large groups of people in close proximity. Um, they're there for a long time and they stay in one place. People are talking and singing, which of course increases a chance of you spreading, I'm probably spraying my computer laptop screen as we speak as well. Um, and you have inconsistent mask wearing. 
Also, given demographics and participation in organized religion, you also have older populations um, who are particularly at risk to, to COVID. So, so given this, the government of British Columbia's health orders have included restrictions on public social gatherings, and they've included religious gatherings in that category. And they proposed alternatives. You can have a Zoom meeting. Look what we're doing right now. It's not hard. Um, and basically what the, the province has argued is that religious gatherings are social gatherings. They're particularly susceptible to spreading COVID. Therefore, they have been discontinued for the time being. Now, a couple interesting points on this, um, and this is actually ongoing, and I keep updating my, uh, my news notifications because the case is being, it's sub-jury right now, but a number of places of worship in British Columbia have challenged these regulations and have been uh, taking the provincial government to court for the right to potentially, I, I assume, imperil the safety and health of their parishioners. And these same places of worship that are challenging the rules and have overtly broken the rules um, have also received permissive and statutory tax exemptions. So for example, the Langley Riverside Cavalry Chapel received $11,997 in permissive tax exemptions from the Township of Langley in 2019. They've been fined twice for violating COVID regulations and they're currently charging the government, uh, trying to challenge those regulations in court. The Emanuel Covenant Reform Church, this is in Abbotsford, received $5,463 in permissive tax exemptions from that municipality in uh, 2019. Uh, and the Oakland's Bible chapter right here in Victoria, um, they again also violated the rules. They received $4,257 from the city of Victoria. Um, and these churches have been joined by a number of individuals and other places of worship challenging the rules. Now the rules are, this case is currently sub jury. So <laughs> Adrian and I and the research team are currently pushing refresh on our news notifications to find out what's gonna happen. But basically, I think regardless of what happens, if the courts carve out a religious exemption or they don't, it really is irrelevant from the broader principle, which is permissive and statutory tax exemptions are designed to support the work of organizations that benefit the community. Undermining, breaking, subverting health regulations designed to protect people from the spread of a deadly global pandemic is not supporting the public benefit. And as such, um, we put forward the, this forward in the report that these, these, these places of worship should not receive permissive tax exemptions moving forward. And municipalities need to have benefits tests to ensure that they're not funding organizations that are directly undermining the law or health regulations. So a couple other points to bring up regarding concerns and issues around tax exemptions. Um, the next point is the issue of tax encroachment. So municipalities have a very limited pool and, and way they can generate funds. They're not allowed to implement their own income taxes or you know, to put taxes on products like wine or beer or marijuana. Um, instead, they, they tend to only tax property. It's very limited. And, and there's also you know, fees from licensing and that, that kind of thing. Um, and as a result, when you have statutory tax exemptions, which Adrian mentioned, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars, that encroaches on the pool of money that that municipalities can, can tax. And when that happens, they have to find that money somewhere. And that means they have to raise taxes for other, other taxpayers. And so this is really encroaching on, on municipalities. And we're talking about significant percentages of municipal budgets. The city of Victoria has a limitation that says that permissive tax exemptions can be no more than 1.6% of their budget. Um, similarly, North Vancouver has a 0.6% um, cap on um, tax exemptions being a component of their budget. So we're talking like about 1% of an entire municipal budget is being given away um, or not collected rather in the form of tax ex and permissive tax exemptions. That's a lot of money that has to be made up somewhere else. And it tends to be made up with by increasing the taxes for everyone else. And there's also the aspect of government municipal autonomy. Um, so as Adriana mentioned, statutory tax exemptions are automatic. They automatically apply to places of worship without any kind of check or control or oversight. And what that means is municipalities don't have the ability to prioritize. Maybe it is the case that Parksville wants to give out tax exemptions to its local places of worship, but maybe it's not. Maybe they have other priorities. And so by making these tax exemptions automatic, municipalities lose a lot of autonomy and they already don't have a significant amount of autonomy. We argue in the report that the individuals that know the best about how to maximize the benefit for their community through tax policy are locally elected officials, not automatic regulations that just give away money. And there's some other concerns as well, how the, the, the tax exemptions are applied. So the first one is really, it is duration. Adrian hinted at this as well. Um, the way the community charter or the Vancouver charter or the, uh, the, the provincial legislation around rural communities, 
excuse me, um, is resolved, is basically permissive tax exemptions are granted for up to 10 years. And except there's a number of exceptions. Those are hospitals, seniors homes, schools, independent schools, and places of worship. Those recipients are granted them in perpetuity. And what we argue in the report is that including places of worship in that category is problematic. Um, and even having a category of automatic perpetual tax exemption is also uh, problematic, regardless of who gets it. Because it, it kind of ignores the fact that times change, situations change. A school was, that was once a school gets rezoned and it's now condos or workspace. Um, but it's particularly the case with places of worship, because what you have is a situation where, you know, a, a place of worship could change denominations and go from being an inclusive place to being a small insular community. Um, a local place of worship could hire a new uh, preacher who could preach hate or discrimination and therefore exclude, or a place of worship could just stop opening its doors to members of the public. It's important that we evaluate the continued ongoing benefits that, that tax recipients um, provide because they might just change their practices. A place of worship could run a soup kitchen every Tuesday for five years and then stop running it. And if that was their only form of public outreach, then it may be the case that they're no longer providing a public benefit, but only a benefit to their members and co-religionists. And then one other point that's worth mentioning is the aspect of uh, commercial operations. So throughout all this conversation, we've had the assumption that, that these places of worship and tax recipients are operating on a not-for-profit basis, but this is not always the case. A really good example is the example of the Central Baptist Church here in Victoria. In 2013, there was a conversation around Victoria's tax exemption policies, and it came to light that the Central Baptist Church of Victoria was operating a, a parkade in downtown Victoria, and they were pulling in $105,000 a year in, in revenue from this parkade. And the place of worship argued basically that they needed the money to pay off the mortgage for their parkade, to pay for their staff, to pay for the security guard, and any money left over went to their ministry. So that ministry is evangelizing and proselytizing to members of the community. And so in essence, what you have in this situation is the permissive tax exemptions that this place of worship was receiving are subsidizing their outreach. And their outreach is a form of proselytizing. So the state is funding and subsidizing religious proselytizing, which is not a position the state should be in. It, it violates fundamentally the principle of separation of religion and government. So those are some of the concerns that we have um, around permissive tax exemptions. And as Adriana mentioned, we're not talking about small amounts of money. You know, we calculated statutory tax exemptions in 2019 to be around $45.9 million and uh, permissive tax exemptions to be $12.5 million. These are significant percentages of municipal budgets and it averages out to about $12 per person in British Columbia. One thing I was going to encourage people to do was to check out the report because we break it down by municipality so you can see just what how much of your personal tax dollars are going to subsidizing places of worship in your municipality. Some places it's zero, some places it's, it's almost I think $46 is at Vanderhoof. Um, you get a lot of a lot of money is going to subsidizing places of worship and they may not provide a benefit to the public um, that's publicly accessible. So overall, what are our recommendations? And I'm excited to hear some people's questions as well. Um, so we recommend two things principally. The first one is abolishing statutory tax exemptions. So these tax exemptions, as I've mentioned several times, they're automatic. And because they're automatic, there's no oversight. There are no mechanisms in place to ensure that people who are receiving tax exemptions um, are actually providing a benefit to the community. And so we think municipalities are in the best position to do that. And because their tax base is being encroached upon and their autonomy is being limited, and because we need oversight for these tax exemptions, we recommend that statutory tax exemptions be abolished. But we also recognize that, you know, as, as Adriana started this conversation with, tax exemptions are a tool that municipalities and government can use to support and, and help foster activities that benefit the community. But it's important that you have oversight. And so our second recommendation is that municipalities adopt and apply uh, rigorous benefits tests for PTE recipients. And, and what this means is basically, first of all, that all permissive tax exemption recipients are treated equally. So if you have a five-year application window, everybody applies for five years. You don't give a special time exemption for certain recipients. We also recognize that that has to be balanced out, right? So having like an annual reporting requirement might be onerous on small organizations, but having it every you know five-year application, that, that's also, we think that's also quite fine. You know, it's okay to say, to make a group apply every five years 
to explain the benefits they provide the community because they are receiving tens of thousands of dollars in tax exemptions. I have spent more time writing a grant for $300 to build a little free library in my park than some municipal tax exemption applications. And to me, that's absurd. It's also very irresponsible from the perspective of municipalities who we would hope would be treating our tax dollars with respect um, and not you know, and having zero oversight. And then just, just to highlight sort of the components of the permissive tax exemption policy and, and the, uh, the BC Humanist Association will be drafting some sample policies in the near future that will circulate to municipalities um, in case they would like to adopt them. But these kinds of benefits tests have to include such elements as um, not operating a commercial enterprise or if they do having restrictions on how much profit they can make, an absence of discrimination, an absence of criminal activity, an absence of support for health codes, um, and basically uh, several checks and balances to ensure that permissive tax exemption and statutory tax exemption recipients are not operating as private clubs, they're not being discriminatory, they're not excluding people, and they aren't undermining public health. Um, and we think if municipalities do that, they would be able to support organizations that provide a benefit to the community they would be able to save tax dollars from going to organizations that might violate their duty to uphold the Canadian Charter. Um, and they would have the ability to make decisions to allocate tax dollars in their municipality in such a way as it maximizes the benefit for their community without having these imposed automatically through statute. Uh, so with that, I'll throw it, we'll throw it to questions. Thank you all very much for your patience. I think we always recognize that sometimes tax policy can get quite dense, but um, I think it's very helpful to explore some of the nuance and how we can try to make our society um, better, more equal, to strengthen the separation of religion and government through how we apply our taxes. I do want to mention one thing which I forgot to mention at the beginning, which is um, the, the numbers that we got to calculate statutory tax exemptions. Um, we pooled our money with the voters without religion and Canadian atheists to buy that data um, because there were some data requirements and we had to, to put money forward. So a huge thank you to those amazing people for um, helping support that. Um, we are a small organization. As Emily mentioned, your donations go a very long way. Um, and uh, buying data is often very challenging. So we're really grateful for our, our friends for helping us support us in that way. Um, and you can see all the raw data in the report as well. So with that, I'll stop rambling and I appreciate your attentiveness. Um, but yeah, I wanted to thank you and Adriana for taking so much time out of your day to like break down this very complex report for us and for producing this report for everyone. Um, Cause it's, it's got some pretty remarkable findings. Uh, I think every I was pretty surprised to know that uh, this, like there's millions of dollars going to churches in BC. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you everyone who came tonight. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your night, everyone. Yeah, thank you all. We'll see you at the next one, friends.